Today we're taking a serious look at biblical slavery. Um, is there a good and moral position from which to defend it? And uh, yeah, for me, when I go looking for answers, I like to go straight to the top. And the top of Christian apologetics is Ravi Zacharias. So I went looking for one of his answers to the, uh, the question of biblical slavery. I'll put a link to the video in the description so you can see the whole thing within its context so that I can, you know, the things that I'm saying about it can be easily tested. If you hear me say something that you don't agree with, feel free to leave me a thumbs down. Um, but if you do, please also leave a comment uh, with your objection. Um, I would like to know if I'm wrong. So this is going to get intense. So before we launch in, I want to make the distinction between the creator of the universe and the gods of different religions, like the God of the Bible, Allah, Krishna, etc. There are as many different ideas of what God is as there are people who believe in God. Whatever the reality of God may be, if the day comes that the mysteries of the universe are revealed to us, whoever you are, whatever you believe, I truly believe it's going to blow your mind and mine. I don't think we can really accurately even imagine what, what that will be. Let's jump in. I'm going to play the video. I'm going to size myself down. Here we go. Um, regarding uh, the, the lady that spoke just beforehand, she's speaking about particular aspects of the Bible that may not, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, that may not um, sit well with us today. Um, I was thinking about um, particularly aspects of uh, maybe like Leviticus 25 where, uh, and, and also Exodus 21 where slavery seems to be condoned by, by God through, throughout, the, throughout the, um, the Old Testament. Um, so my question would be is, if God did once condone it, and today under secular moral laws in, in society, we've deemed it outlawed, it's, it's, we're not allowed to have slaves anymore. Um, are we wrong, or is that still, could, could we effectively go back to a theocracy and have slaves as per Leviticus 25 and Exodus 21 and be justified? Okay, the sound on this video is a little bit muddy, so um, I'm just going to reiterate his question. Basically, um, because the Bible seems to condone slavery, are we wrong, or could we use the Bible to go back to a theocracy where slavery is permitted, or uh, could we could slavery be a part of a modern day moral, biblically based system? Before watching this, my guess was that the answer would likely be to a question that was never asked. So I just want you to listen closely to the answers that are given and see what you think. Here we go. <laughs> I feel like in many respects I'm being offered on the slaughter of sacrifice right now. <laughs> it's a very, very fair question. And again, it's one that has a lot of deep kind of nuance in the way that biblical thinkers have thought about this over the centuries. Unfortunately, the Christian church has a very dark history at certain points along where you'll find over in the US, for instance, great advocates of colonial slavery at the time there that were using the Bible to defend their right to own slaves, the idea that slaves were less than human, their freedom to be able to beat slaves, uh, all kinds of injustices have been done while claiming the name of God and then the authority of certain Old Testament texts and so it's a very fair question and one we need to wrestle with. I think the way many Christian thinkers have thought about this over the centuries has been to try and understand the sweep of the Bible, not so much as perhaps many other sacred texts which are disembodied, deculturated statements of God's eternal purpose for every human across the face of the planet at all times. But as God is working throughout history, we see something they call progressive revelation. The idea of helping humanity grow up in its understanding of who God is and the reality of the cultural world around them to be able to become mature and prepared to be able to understand and carry the teachings of Jesus Christ. Okay, so immediately, this, is, this guy's name is Daniel Peterson. He immediately works to try to zoom out from the harshness of the reality of the question so that the focus can be I guess, sort of blurred to encompass the excellent teachings to be found in the Bible. The overarching message is much more palatable uh, to the to the modern day Christian. So Christian apologists would rather not focus on the parts that are potentially immoral, because if they're found to be immoral on their own, they may have to be disavowed, potentially starting a very scary chain of, of events that may force a Christian to question everything that they've given their life to, which is a terrifying proposition, which I know I understand it firsthand because I have been in those trenches myself. 
So we're going to go on from there. So, for instance, Jesus would speak, and then the, his first followers, the apostles in the New Testament, would speak of the law as being a schoolmaster, essentially be able to help them to prepare an old covenant that Jesus has now come to offer a new covenant, something which was set up as a political reality, a theocracy in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel, then something that's meant to be an, uh, something that spreads out across the many cultures and different politics of the world, how we live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, showing what it means to follow the way of Jesus, irrespective of the rest of the culture around us. Okay, so here he's bringing up Jesus, and I do want to say that not once in the whole of the Gospels did Jesus speak out against slavery. And as God, Jesus could have easily have said something like, it is written that you may own slaves, but I tell you that no man should be owned by a godly man. Something like that. I know that Jesus didn't get political as far as like changing the politics of the greater area, but at least to, to say that within this group of people having a better, you know, an evolving moral framework that that wasn't going to be part of it anymore. Um, he said things continually through the Gospels like that, challenging the old paradigms and changing things for the better, but he never spoke against slavery. I've got my notes here. Next, the question is asked about dispensationalism, uh, meaning that God dispensed better information as the people were ready for it. Here we go. Now, when it comes to the slavery question, I'll, I'll just finish the arc and then I'll, I'll oh, love to get some feedback. Is like a form of dispensationalism where... Well, Not, well, dispensationalism is a technical theological word, and so we wouldn't say that there's particular ages in that sense, but it, it's God working within the boundaries of the nature of people and the cultures that they are a part of to come up with the best kind of solution. Okay, Daniel Peterson has just set himself the nearly impossible task of showing how God's most perfect solution, the best thing that God could come up with at the time, was slavery. Now, I think he's getting into some really muddy waters here. I've seen this video a bunch of times. Even the first time, though, it was like, I don't know if he's going to get himself out of this one. Not at least for someone who really is listening closely and paying attention to what he's saying. Now, let's go back to a, a, something to deal with uh, criminals, for instance. In the Old Testament system, they don't have penitentiaries. Okay, this is patently false. Clearly, they don't have a prison system. The first book of the Bible, chapter 39, verse 20, talks about Joseph being put in prison in Egypt. So if the Bible is correct... At very least, the structure for prison already existed to punish non-capital offenses in a way that was not slavery. The writer of Genesis is clearly cognizant of the existence of a prison system. They don't have guards and turret towers and weapons and ways of being able to keep people. And so the kind of laws and way of dealing with justice is very different than a situation where your technology and your culture would allow uh, different options that are available to you. So here he's trying to make a case that the almighty God of the Bible had no other option than to ordain slavery. So when it comes to the questions like slavery, the first thing I'd say is we need to distinguish deeply between our experience of colonial slavery and the kidnapping of people groups from Africa, the idea of them being less than human. Were slaves of the Bible considered to be fully human with all of the same human rights or were they considered to be actually less than human? Exodus 21.12, in the section dealing with personal injury and the penalties for such actions, it says, anyone who strikes another person is to be put to death. So I want you to just keep that word person in your mind because it is a separate word. There is a separate word for person, for servant, and for slave. Okay, so later in the same chapter, verses 20 and 21 say, if a man beats his male or female slave with a club, and other versions say a rod, and the slave dies as a result, the owner must be punished. Now, as an aside, I just want to say there's no definition on what that punishment is. Um, everywhere else in the Bible, punishment for specific crimes, the punishments are equally specific. Concerning a girl's virginity at the time of her marriage, Deuter Deuteronomy 22, 20 says... If no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her house, and the men of her town shall stone her to death. So this is a very specific offense or a sin, and it's got a very specific punishment that is prescribed along with it. So we'll move on to verse 22. But if the slave recovers within a day or two, then the owner shall not be punished, because the slave is his property. Remember that word person from earlier in the chapter. Killing a person is punishable by being put to death. It's very specific. Killing a slave is punishable by a subjective punishment. 
So by the standards of Exodus 21, a slave does not have the same protection under the, the Mosaic law. Um, all right, we're going to move on here. The treatment and the nature of which colonial slavery happened, which is much closer in our cultural memory, something that's racially driven. He's trying to say that colonial slavery was much different than biblical slavery because colonial slavery was racially driven. Um, so Leviticus 25, verse 39, if one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell himself to you, do not treat him as a slave. Treat him as, instead as a hired worker or as a temporary resident who lives with you, and he will serve you until the year of the Jubilee. So then we're going to skip down to verse 44. However, you may purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around you. You may also purchase the children of temporary residents who live among you, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat them as slaves, but you must never treat your fellow Israelites this way. This is the God of the Bible speaking to Moses. Um, and at the end, he signs off, I am the Lord your God. So we're going to go from there. Then coming into the Old Testament where slavery was a way of much more indentured servitude, of working your way out of poverty, a way of integrating new populations, of all kinds of ways of being able to help. Okay, being able to help, uh, it seems like a very intentional misreading and misuse of, of the biblical text. I don't like that he is, is saying that slavery is a way to help. It really bothers me. So we're going to move on. Uh, set up a culture where for six years people would work and then they're essentially free. Uh, it would be a nanny system or a butler system or in terms of the kind of working conditions, it's radically different than our thinking of colonial slavery in the way in which the African peoples were treated. Okay, so he is talking about an Israelite servanthood to another Israelite. And I absolutely agree that is radically different than to how our colonial slaves were treated. Yes, apples are different than oranges. I agree. Let's move on. In no place are slaves in the Bible, in terms of Israel, treated as being less than human. Except for Exodus 21.12, Exodus 21.20, Exodus 21.26 and 27, and basically the rest of Exodus 21, and Leviticus 25.39, Leviticus 25.42 and 43, Numbers 16.14, Deuteronomy 21.14, and Deuteronomy 24.7, which essentially all say not to treat another person, whoever that may be in the verse, as you would treat a slave. But you're right. There is still this deeply uncomfortable nature of them being slaves, of sometimes being speaking almost of property of certain conditions that are there. Because the slave is his property. When you trace that through into the New Testament, the vision of God's future world that's slowly coming to bear as God's revealing himself and his people are responding. In the future world, we have people of every tribe and every tongue standing as part of God's community, fully equal, man, woman, young, old, irrespective of all of those. There's no barriers or denotions of who has a greater value than anyone else. And in the sweep of that biblical story of us being broken and part of a fallen world, but we're having to create structures and systems that help make steps forward. I got to stop him right there. He just said where we're trying to make systems that help make steps forward. I just need to remind you that this was God ordaining the Old Testament system of slavery through to that final world where God will return. What we see happening in the New Testament is, is amazing. This is, the, this is the play where it's like, look at the, don't look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, you know, it's not pleasing. Let's look at the New Testament. Please go watch the whole video, but I am going to fast forward this about a minute here, um, and we're going to get uh, on with it. Leviticus 25, 44 yeah. does clearly stipulate that, that it is that colonial slavery where you can get slaves from the nations around you and they become your property for life. That it's not quite indentured servitude, though, is it? Okay, he's being very gracious. The, the person asking the question here is saying, Leviticus 25 is saying that you can buy slaves from the surrounding areas and that there will, they will be your slaves for life. And so it's not quite indentured servitude, is it? So he's, he's really trying to hold Daniel's feet to the fire here to, to get a straight answer about this very straight question. So when we're dealing with Leviticus again, this is in the lead up to the idea of the Canaan account that we we're talking about before the clearing of the land. In this sort of a situation, we need to ask the question, let's say all of the, the men of a particular area went to war against Israel and all of the men were in this situation killed. 
what opportunity then do you have for anyone who's a woman or a child to be able to survive economically in the ancient world? There isn't one. In this very specific and from what I can tell nowhere to be found uh, scenario that Daniel's setting up here, Israel is simply defending itself against an attacker and killing every man in the attacking army. First off, the Israelites were rarely on the defensive. They were almost always the aggressor, conquering, killing every man, woman, and child, and burning the cities to the ground after stealing everything that they wanted and keeping the virgin women for themselves. We'll get into that verse uh, later. But that doesn't sound at all godly. So he's trying to have us imagine this much softer approach where the Israelites are, are responding by taking all of those dead men's wives and children's in as a show of mercy. In the couple of biblical scenarios that are like this, where, is, where Israel is defending itself, they would end up mounting a counterattack after defeating an incoming army. During the counterattack is where they would kill the, the rest of the agrarian men, um, the women and children, um, would be taken as slaves often, but only if God didn't order them to be slaughtered. So I've got Numbers 31, 7 through 18 here. They fought against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. Among their victims, so, and we're talking, this is a counterattack, so there were men left in the, in the city here. They killed every man. Among their victims were Evi, Rickham, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. The, the Israelites captured the Midianite women and children and took all the Midianite herds, flocks, and goods as plunder. They burned all the towns where the Midianites had settled, as well as their camps. They took the plunder and the spoils, including the people and animals. And they brought the captives, spoils, and plunder to Moses and Eleazar the priest and the Israelite assembly at their camp on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the leaders of the community went to meet them outside the camp. Moses was angry with the officers of the army who returned from the battle. Have you allowed the women to live? He asked them, they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to their Lord in the Peor incident, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Now kill all the boys, kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. And we are talking girls, little girls here. We're not talking about women who have, who have never slept, slept with a man because it would have said, now kill all the boys and girls. Kill every woman and save for yourself only the young women who have never slept with a man. It says, kill all the boys, kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourself every girl who has never slept with a man. They also attacked peaceful cities. Um, this story is of the Danite army of Israel attacking Laish. This is in Judges 18, and again, please read the whole thing for yourself, but I'm going to get straight to the point here. They said to him, and, and this is a priest that they're talking to, please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. And their journey was basically to attack uh, the city of Laish. The priest answered him, go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. Um, they answered, come, let's attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate and go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find unsuspecting people and spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing whatsoever. They went to Laish against the people at peace and secure. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. Against a people at peace and secure. I mean, this is a ruthless attacker. So, And I can barely take it any more of of this guy's uh, apologetics so uh, luckily we've got Ravi stepping in soon uh, you'll see him start to get increasingly sort of fidgety as he really wants to take over and and sort of do some triage here try to stop the bleeding that's that's that feels like it's happening we would look upon it now but in respect it's probably the best option that they had available to them other than leaving them to die or to prostitute themselves and so I think when we're working within the confines of the culture, there can be something there that's helpful as a way to be able to make some forward steps. We've already violated the laws here. Each person was permitted one question. You've had five. He still didn't receive an answer to his actual question. So he keeps asking the question. He keeps rephrasing and being more specific to try to pull an, an answer for his question out of Daniel, and he's not getting it. So we've given you, we've given you more grace than law. Uh, 
Okay, so he says, I've given you more grace than law, saying that he's asked more questions than he was supposed to. And so he's basically shutting this guy down from being more specific and pressing the question further, even though it's not getting answered. Basically, the only more grace than law that I see happening here is these guys' grace for the Bible while not acknowledging its law. Your assumption is actually very flawed. It's not Leviticus 25 alone that talks about slavery. If you look at the Near Eastern world at that time and see what was going on with the surrounding nations. Here he seems to be saying that because everyone else was doing it, it was somehow acceptable for a morally perfect God to do the same as the barbaric and somewhat evil nations around them. And I guess the only thing I can say to that is, how can you be good and do as evil does? And you come up even up to the 18th and 19th centuries. Mahatma Gandhi resisted what the West was doing. And he resisted it by saying, you are not living up to your own presuppositions on what Jesus Christ taught you. If you look at slavery and sexual slavery today, and even slavery of years gone by, it was not just that the West was involved in it. So many nations, the Middle East was involved in it. And still till this very day, a lot of that goes on. I was raised in a home with servants who had no privacy of their own lives. And I watched my mother teach me how to treat a servant. If I go back to India today, the servants who worked for us all their lives would literally want to come and touch my feet and I move them away and they will still call me Ravi Baba, Ravi little boy. We use the word servant. They were actually be like members of the family. Okay, and this is the same description as the servants of the Bible, which is very different from the slaves of the Bible. So, not to be disrespectful here, but I kind of want to ask, how hard did you or your parents beat your servants? Probably not at all. You were probably very gracious because they were servants. They were more like members of the family. They were not slaves. Again, he is skirting the issue. He is simply not addressing biblical slavery. Abraham sent Eliezer to go to look for his daughter-in-law as he was looking for a bride for Isaac. And I just leave you with this thought. Your concern is, is real because your moral conscience is railing against what you're reading in Leviticus and Exodus and so on. Dan was spot on. There is a process of revelation that is going on. And in that process, they see how laws alone exploited and abused people. I think if you watch how Jesus comes and explains what the law was intended to do and was unable to do, and how only the grace of Christ was able to do it, history has sustained that. Martin Luther King Jr., his sermons were some of the most powerful sermons ever preached, and he preached from the scriptures. The scriptures that Martin Luther King preached from were absolutely excellent, but again, they are not the scriptures in question here. I just wish he would answer the question. And it seems very clear to me by this point in the video that he just doesn't have an answer. This premier Christian apologist doesn't have an answer. That's a real problem. That seems to be a big crack in the foundation for which there is no patch. He taught, he was talking to the American and what they were doing to their brothers. The slaves in the time there were learning their hymns and writing uh, Negro spirituals and so on. It is a tribute, today the black man will say, it is a tribute to the person of Jesus Christ that they followed the very God that the white man was using with which to abuse them. I've heard them make that statement because they saw the disconnect between what Christ was teaching and you never ever judge a religion by its abuse. Never judge a religion by its abuse. I would, I would tweak that a little to say, never judge a religion as a whole by its abusers, but also we should never exempt any religion from admitting the abuse that its God commands. 
In this next part, Ravi Zacharias is going to assert that morality itself comes from the Christian God specifically. This is something that every religion claims to be true of their God, and they also claim that it's false when it comes to the God of other religions. As you're watching the law unfold, and the law unable to do what it was intended to do, and you see as you come in the very person of Jesus Christ, talking about things that you and I would probably have not talked about. He never once talked about the Roman yoke. Did he think it was right? No. He never ever once criticized the Caesars. Did he think it was right? He really believed that these symptomatic issues, when you solve them, are never really solutions. They are band-aids put to a broken joint. And it is only because of the imperatives of Christ that you would even be standing here believing it would be immoral to victimize a slave from any other place. Natural law doesn't tell you that. There's no natural law that tells you that. Natural law would tell you if evolutionary theory is taken into metaphysical proposition, nature is read in tooth and claw. That's exactly where naturalism takes you. Darwin mourned the fearsomeness of what would happen if we take this scientific theory and put it into moral postulates and metaphysics. That's where we would end up. So I end up with one statement for you. You can smile, but you're invoking a moral framework that naturalism doesn't give to you. Can we talk later? I... Yeah, well, I'd love to talk later when I get some time. I'd love to talk later. But here's what I say to you. If you go to Gandhi's home in India, you'll see a banner written by an atheist, Bertrand Russell. And here's what he said. It is doubtful that the Mahatma's attempt would have succeeded, except that he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. Here is the testimony of an atheist applauding the success of a pantheist because of the beliefs of a theist. It is doubtful that the Mahatma would have succeeded except he was appealing to the conscience of a Christianized people. That is why Mahatma Gandhi carried a New Testament with him all his life and quoted from it, your aspirations are noble, which are not justifiable by naturalistic assumptions. They are only justifiable in a transcendent moral framework. And that I'd be very happy to talk to you about and we'll find some time to do it before we go. We bring this to a close and thank you very much. Okay, this is a really good place to end. The majority of the Christians that I have met do have a very strong moral compass, and I would say that it is probably too strong for their priests, their pastors, their clergy to teach the darker parts of the Bible for fear that their tithing congregations might just leave. That's the end of a church. Um, but, but these people have taken a lot of time. They've given their they've given their conscience time and space where it can mold them, where it can help them become who they want to be. To close, I want to talk about the problem of evil, and it goes basically like this. God is all good and all powerful, yet evil exists. So if God is capable of stopping evil, but doesn't, then God must not be all good. If God wants to stop evil, and can't, then God must not be all-powerful. So the Christian apologetic answer to this uh, has a few steps. Step one is to reduce all evil basically down to the kind of evil that humans perpetrate on each other. Step two is to say that God didn't want a whole bunch of automatons who had to love him because that's not real love. Real love must come with a free choice. And step three is to say that with that free choice to follow God is also the choice to turn away from God. So you've got the choice to do evil, and that doing evil is what explains how there is evil in, in the world. The problem with this is that it doesn't take into account needless suffering like children with cancer, um, like the suffering that comes to an old person who has dementia, the suffering of their family around them, um, the suffering from, you know, natural disasters that claim the lives of children who have not yet had the chance to make their first moral decision, um, the deaths of those people, uh, large swaths of the population dying to, you know, due to tsunamis and things like that. I'll set aside all of those and 
grant God the attribute of placing this incredible value on freedom. For this reason, one main tenet of Christian apologetics is freedom. Did a freedom-loving God really call for brutal slavery, for captivity, which is the polar opposite of human freedom? I believe that some Christians have traded in worshiping and coming closer to the creator of the universe in favor of worshiping the inerrancy of the Bible because they believe it to be the same thing. Like to deny one portion of the Bible or one verse or one word, one jot or tittle of the Bible would be to deny not just a part in many cases, but the entirety of God, which is a very terrifying place to be in. I'm here to tell you it's okay to test each verse individually. Actually, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things, reject what is evil, cling to the good. I really held on to that verse when I was questioning the Bible. I, and I believed for myself, you know, like, like Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was like, okay, if you're telling the truth, and you're the truth, when I go looking for the truth, I'll be right back. I'll find my way back to you by only a search for the truth with, n with no presuppositions. So I want to encourage you to test it all and find that if you're more moral than the things that you're reading, it's okay to begin to let those go and understand that all of the good parts that make you your best can be separate from the parts that your soul has been just trying to deal with for the longest time, but can't make sense of. If you have any doubts at all, it's because there's something that you are not convinced of that you believe you're supposed to be convinced of. You already don't believe this stuff, and it's okay to say you don't believe it. I can tell you, as someone ha having come through the other side, the parts of this that just felt like a stain on my soul to accept they actually muddied up the better parts of me. They made me question if the better parts of me were real at all, if the better parts of the Bible that I was trying to live by were anything at all, which is why I used to say the same kind of thing, that like my moral framework comes from the Bible. I didn't realize that, uh, that it came from anywhere else. So I just want to encourage you, if you're going through this stuff, come talk to me. Like... Talk to me in the comments. If, if we connect in the comments, I'll give you my email address. Um, we can talk in person. We can talk over the phone. Also, if I missed anything, if I'm wrong, if you believe that I'm wrong, if you've got you know anything like that, leave it in the comments. Um, let's start a dialogue where we can really uh, start to work this stuff out.